This is James Turner with O'Reilly News here live at OSCON 2008. I'm with Josh Berkus, who is on the core team for the Postgres. I'm not going to pronounce it. Postgres. Postgres. Yeah, Postgres. Thank you. Uh, development team, and until this week, was an employee of Sun Microsystems. And as I understand, you were you basically were on the Postgres support team there. Yeah. Well, Sun actually had a sm had has still has um, a small development and support team for Postgres at Sun uh, as part of its databases department. So we obviously have to start by asking the question, why are you formerly with Sun? Um, the, mostly I joined Sun in order to want to do some really interesting and exciting things in open source. And really what's on the schedule for the next couple of years for the whole databases department at Sun does not really involve any exciting or interesting things. Why would you say that is? Um, a lot, there's a very strong focus on making revenue um, for, for reasons that would be obvious for anybody who looked at Sun's stock ticker last week. So as Sun acquired MySQL, obviously there was a change in focus probably around. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. I mean, I have to admit that that uh, a lot of my interest, uh, you know, at Sun and my interest in general um, has always been to make PostgreSQL the number one SQL database. Um, and working at a company where there were uh, 12 Postgres engineers and 300 MySQL engineers, um, uh, you know, I made that go. Or a ragtag really crew of. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem rebel is that forces. Yeah. The problem is that that only really works in the movies. Right. So you were telling me before the, the interview started that. Um, I was not aware of this. There was some breaking news about MySQL today. Yeah. So um, one of the things that, that, that happened this morning um, is that Brian Aker actually announced a GPL-only fork of MySQL, uh, something called Drizzle, uh, that he's been working on for a bit. Um, I, I actually found out about it last week. Um, and was uh, am now on the mailing list for that. It's very interesting because they're doing with MySQL what I always felt that they should do um, since it became a big sort of corporate concern, which is that you know MySQL became successful because it was a small, fast, simple, easy to use database. Right. And then MySQL AB went and added all of this complicated functionality to it that turned it into sort of an inferior copy of Postgres from a technical perspective. Or an inferior copy of or or Oracle. Or Oracle, of Oracle right, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, by adding all kinds of views and stored procedures and query caching and all of these enterprise tools and that sort of thing, um, which was really getting very far away from the original MySQL user base. Um, so Drizzle as a project is, you know, the, as I understand it, um, I, uh, according to the, the beers that I had with the, the guys the other night, that they cut like 100,000 lines of code um, from, from MySQL and pared it down to a, a, a lean and mean MySQL and worked on cleaning up sort of long-standing bugs and performance issues. Now, is this a real split in the, in the development team, or is this like a, another direction they're taking in the same effort? Uh, we'd really have to ask Brian that, um, the, um, because I just know it as, as you know, sort of an outsider. Um, the, uh, well, uh, friends with Brian, but um, I, I mean, I don't, I haven't been involved in the code myself. Uh, but, but I mean, this really would be a different direction for MySQL because obviously the, the sort of Sun MySQL main effort is towards an increasing amount of enterprise functionality, um, and a, um, you know, and they're working on MySQL 6.0 with Falcon and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and Drizzle is very different; it's designed specifically to be small. Well, let's go back to to Postgres. I have to say honestly that. For me and a lot of the people that I work with, Postgres kind of is the the the, the database we don't think about. Yeah. You know, if we're talking enterprise, we we think about Oracle usually, and then we try to figure out if we can use MySQL instead of Oracle. I, why do you think it is that Postgres has kind of lagged in, in thought share? Yeah, in public awareness. Well, for one thing, you know, the project has historically always been sort of by and for database geeks. Um, specifically that, that if you look at the people who started the Postgres project, were all career DBAs. 
um, and and did not tend to be very publicity oriented. Um, and then, um, you know, also your do you work you work for O'Reilly? Yeah. Well, I have I have a day job too. You have a day job too. Yes. Okay. So I'm a software um, engineer. The um, so it hasn't you know it hasn't received as much publicity, and then of course, uh, Postgres is a community. Uh, project supported by a variety of companies, but that means that you don't have a single company pumping millions of dollars into marketing for it. Um, it tends to be a lot lower profile. Um, the um, a, but but it's also a lot more used than it is talked about. And um, the uh, like some other open source stuff. I mean, for that matter, most people tend not to think about free BSD. Um, including a lot of people who are actually using it. Right. I, in fact, I was yeah. I was going to make the analogy that yeah. Postgres seems to be kind of like I don't want to say elitist, but it's like the, uh, people who are Postgres involved in Postgres either as users or as as people who who use it in their code tend to take the attitude when you talk about MySQL. Oh, yes, that's a very nice little database. Yeah. Down there. Yeah. Well, the the thing is that I think a lot of people really don't understand the the concept of database differentiation, um, uh, which which is actually happens to a much greater degree in databases than it does in other technologies because databases tend to be so performance constrained. So every decision you make in the chain of developing a database is something you have to decide not to do. So that, for example, if you want to support really complicated queries because of the parser that you have to have to do that and the optimizer, it means that you're going to run really simple queries slower. Um, which is actually one of the differences between Postgres and MySQL. That is, Postgres runs complicated queries better, MySQL runs simple queries better. Um, it's an, a bit of a generalization, but, but it's generally true. And the... Um, and you know, and you know, you get a whole chain where you can get, you can start with the same sort of general parser library and end up with something like SQLite you know, which runs primarily in mobile phones and is a little tiny and effectively, you know, single user, um, you know, or something like Postgres that really doesn't even perform well unless you throw a few hundred users at it. Um, so the, um, so, you know, in that case, so Postgres' sort of whole focus is on enterprise database use, on people who really need a very robust database to sustain a large workload um, or need some very advanced features and environments where you have a dedicated database administrator. Right, and a lot of what the growth in database use has not been in that space. It's been in the very small, low volume, high value website transactions where pretty much any database that you can trust to do a transaction is, is going to do for a lot of those people. Yeah, well, it it really depends. I mean, obviously, in the sort of the sort of traditional space has been growing relatively slowly and incrementally, and that was why I actually mentioned advanced features. Is that well, even within, within the Postgres world, the growth of of PostGIS, Postgres SQL with geographic information, is of course meteorically larger than than the growth of Postgres without that, um, because the the basic growth of Postgres has been largely for the sort of traditional Oracle DB2 market. Um, you know, that we've been invading, but, but a lot of that has been at the expense of the proprietary databases rather than necessarily by creating new users. Right. Um, the, um, and um, the, growth, uh, of Postgres, the growth of Postgres for things that you can only do with Postgres well, like GIS and genomics, um, has been much larger because that's, that's a completely new market. Um, and, and, you know, obviously anytime you're going from 10 people <laughs> upwards, the, the percentage growth is huge. Um, whereas the, the traditional SQL transactional relationship is, that's a fairly mature market. And it's going to probably continue to grow steadily just because a greater number of people have access to computers, but it won't grow by multiples. One of the things we're seeing is if, for instance, you look at what Google is doing with App Engine, they've rejected the whole concept pretty much of relational databases in terms in because they don't believe it scales for the type of applications they're doing. Do you think that relational databases have been overprescribed or that? Yeah, I would say actually that the time of relational databases, of, of traditional single server SQL relational databases, so your sort of Oracle definition, um, uh, because it's really Oracle that actually sort of created that, that definition, historically speaking. Um, 
they, that the age of, of the traditional SQL single server SQL relational database um, being 80% of the database market, that's behind us. Um, and where you're going to see a lot of really rapid growth is in um, more specialized databases. Um, because it simply used to be true that if you were a small to mid-sized company, both in terms of personnel and in terms of computing resources, you couldn't afford to have multiple database servers running multiple products. Well, now you can run a pretty credible database in your desktop machine. Um, you can run a database that's a lot faster than some of the stuff I work with when I started. Uh, you know, on my laptop. My laptop's got more power than you know than the first you know, than the first mainframe server I work with. So. The, as a result, you know, and because a lot of this is being driven by open source, those products are much easier to use than the proprietary specialty databases have been. So both the computing resources and the personnel resources now allow companies and organizations to actually run multiple specialty databases and use the best database for the right task. So what I think you're going to see in the future is your traditional SQL relational databases are going to live at what they actually are good at. You know, which is your sort of financial management applications and reporting. You really can't beat SQL relational for reporting. Um, and then you're going to have specialty databases of various types. Column store and, and hybrids for data warehousing. Um, your sort of uh, hash distributed table databases for cases where throughput is more important than sophistication. Um, the um, uh, document oriented databases for cases where simplicity is more important than features, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, you probably some, some, you know, XML databases. I understand even, like, I mean, one of the reasons why I believe this is like, I, I talk to the cache folks occasionally. They've got um, the, the sort of, you know, uh, end result of the whole multi dimensional database line. And, you know, uh, they were basically, as far as I can tell, scraping by for like the last five years. And all of a sudden in the last year, they've taken off. They've got like, you know, the, their customer base has grown tenfold. Um, and a lot of that is because people say, well, we, a multi-dimensional database makes sense for this one task, and we can now afford to do it for this one task. Um, I have to say one trend I've noticed is a lot of the traditional wisdom about normalization of databases was based on disks are expensive, throughput is expensive, um, memory is expensive, and I've seen a lot of people actually moving away to denormalizing a lot of their data because the cycle is what's most expensive to them right now. Yeah, well, you see, and that's actually a result of a lot of misunderstanding. Um, now, it's true that a lot of traditional databases architecturally have been focused on I.O. It's a problem we actually have in the Postgres world and something that we're, we're trying to move away from engineering-wise to the idea that with large memory, uh, an increasing amount of uh, your data is going to be cached um, and should be treated differently uh, than data that's on disk. But um, that actually has... But that, that's actually a matter of how you handle I.O. and how you handle optimization plans and that sort of thing. There's nothing to do with no normalization. Normalization happens on the logical level and can happen in memory or across a cluster um, as easily as it can happen you know, on a single server database on disk. Um, and what normalization actually has to do with is the long-term maintainability of your data. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the things is that, that one of the reactions I've seen from a lot of application developers who get into databases is the first time, even before they run into a performance problem, they immediately say, well, I'm going to denormalize it because it's faster. Well, then I say, what do you mean faster? Exactly how is it faster? Because, again, when developing a database application, like when developing a database engine, every choice you make is a trade-off. And if you make the trade-off before you know what you're trading, chances are it's going to be wrong. Right, but I've seen it go the other way where people, the classic one I see is, oh, address should be its own table. And because we've got companies that have addresses and consumers who have addresses, and almost every time I've seen that done, it's turned out to be a bad decision, at least in the short run, because it turns out that you end up with these very... Um, complicated joins that you're using all the time. Yeah. We well, see, the, see, the part of that's also your, your MySQL experience talking. Um, because in databases that have a more sophisticated set of tools, um, there's a way to uh, simplify a lot of that. Um, and for example, doing a 15-table join in Postgres is really not a problem. Um, and, uh, and on top of which, generally, if you actually do need a complex schema to represent 
a set of data that is complex, um, then you can also use views to simplify that. Uh, MySQL in 5 or 5.1 actually has views, but I understand that they're a little bit hard to use and as a result are not very used. Um, the, um, uh, the, so um, that's part of it. I mean, but the idea of normalization in general is that, so there's two ideas behind normalization. One is the non-duplication of data, um, which is an important maintenance issue because anytime you have duplicate data, then you, then you have the opportunity for your data to become out of sync. Um, and once your data becomes out of sync, you don't know which data is correct. So, so that's part of it. And the other idea of normalization is the very simple idea, which is that the theoretical model, the, the, which, which every database is just a theoretical model of your data, the theoretical model of your data should correspond in some logical way to the real data in the world. Well, Josh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And um, if anybody needs a really comp competent uh, database engineer, I guess Josh is on the market. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you can Google for his address. So thank you very much for spending some okay. time talking to us. Well, good to meet you, and thank you very much.